Well, good morning and welcome to church this morning. Today is really a day of celebration as we think about um, what Jesus has done for all of us and especially celebrate the baptism of our three friends this morning. So as we start, we're going to sing praises to God. So please stand up and sing with me. God, you're so good. 
much of this life brings suffering. Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. God, your soul. Lord God, we, uh, we thank you that we know you are good and uh, we want to praise you as we think about uh, what it is you've offered for us in Jesus. We pray, Lord, as we celebrate that this morning together, as we continue to celebrate it, as we celebrate it uh, with baptisms and confirmations, as we open your word, Lord, we pray that our, our hearts will be reminded of your goodness and uh, inspired once again to serve you wholeheartedly. Amen. As you grab a seat. Let me offer another warm welcome to church this morning. My name's Daniel. I'm the senior minister here. It's great you're here. What a great Sunday to be in church. We are, of course, uh, celebrating with baptisms and confirmations this morning. And so uh, extra welcome to all of you who are here specially to celebrate with uh, one of the three that are being baptized and confirmed this morning. Um, you can see our, our, our tank is set up. I think we finally got the water temperature right. It's... Uh, it's a very nice, warm bath there. Um, before we get to, to some of that, let me tell you some of the other things that are happening around our church. One of them is just uh, in our church community this week, we had some babies born, two babies on Tuesday. So uh, Lila Trouch and Theodore Tennant were both born this last week on Tuesday. We look forward to seeing them in church with us one day soon. Um, but uh, great, and congratulations to those families um, for the birth of their, their babies. Uh, talking about babies, children, uh, Father's Day is two weeks away now, and uh, so we're going to celebrate Father's Day as we always do as a church. So our regular service times, 8, 10, and 5, will be happening, but we'll have some other Father's Day things in there. Uh, the 10 a.m. service, the kids program, will have some extra Father's Day crafts and activities. We'll get the jumping castle out. We'll do some food. So great, uh, great Sunday to come along again and join together in community uh, at our Father's Day services in two weeks. Uh, we are um, celebrating this morning with um, Jack and Caitlin and Yoan, and uh, we're going to uh, have their baptisms in just a moment. And I'll talk about that in just a moment, but uh, we're going to take a moment now to meet them, and we're going to do that through a video. So here's a, a short video telling a little bit of their story. I 
feel like my involvement with Christianity when I was growing up, uh, it was definitely present. My dad introduced it to me from a very young age. I did attend church when I was younger, but I found as I was growing up, I kind of lost direction with faith and going into the more high school years, I definitely found myself get lost in different crowds and yeah, I lost a bit of my faith. <laughs> I was not brought up in a Christian family. My parents were not Christian, and neither was uh, my extended family. I did have friends that were Christian, but they didn't speak much about their beliefs and didn't feel like I could ask them for advice or guidance. I grew up in a Christian household. When I was five in 2016, we moved overseas to Turkey. The big things in my life at that time were like trying to live in a space that I was unfamiliar with and trying to figure out like what was happening and you know learning languages and stuff and that sort of like was almost like a barrier to God because I was just trying to push through that barrier. So I come to know about God but not so much know God, not really have a personal relationship with him. I remember being 17 and something had tragic happened in my life and I remember my dad being there for me. I remember he pulled me aside and he said, I, I wanna pray for you. And he sat there and he prayed for me. And I feel like from that day, I felt really connected to with my dad and with Jesus. And I feel like that had been with me the whole time. I feel like that faith had never left me. He was always there for me. He was waiting for me to come find him again. And he had out his arm for me and I grabbed it at the right time and I'm, you know, I'm not, not letting go of that again. One day I came home from work and there was a Bible left on the dining table and I realised it must have been my sister's. She had just been attending church with her friends and then so um, I think she got given a Bible and I so happened to see it and I just wanted to read it, you know. Because like I, I'd always, had beliefs and I always felt like I had a little bit of faith inside of me so when I saw that there was an opportunity I, I wanted to take it and that's when I opened it up and started reading yeah and then it just yeah it all happened then <laughs> yeah I was drawn to uh, the words on the page and it made me want to go out and buy my own bible which I did and I started to read the bible almost every night and I kept learning more and more about it every day. I then wanted to start uh, attending church. So I spoke to Caitlin about attending church and we both thought it was a good idea, but we didn't know where to start. I was at a youth group and it was at a youth group where they did worship. And so instead of the worship one day, they put on music and they turned the lights down and they it's a big centre and they just said, everyone just go to a sort of quiet space and pray and reflect on God. And while I was sitting there by myself just praying, like I just felt a immeasurably just big force. I sort of just, I prayed and for once I felt like I wasn't talking to a brick wall, but I was actually like praising and like accepting God into my life, like sort of, it felt like, yeah, it was actually someone on the end of the other, the other end of the phone line kind of thing. Um, and I, I, yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. Definitely talking to my dad a lot. He's definitely my biggest inspiration. He had introduced to Jack and myself the Alpha course, and he had asked if we'd like to come and attend. It was the first time I'd ever been to a church. Um, so it was quite, it did feel quite uh, intimidating and I was a bit nervous. However, I immediately felt comfortable and it got me thinking a lot. And I liked being in a group of people and everyone asking questions and everyone answering questions. And it felt like a really comfortable and safe environment to learn more about Christianity. I feel like they've really helped me with my faith, seeing their stories and their beliefs. So thankfully I get to sit with them every single week at church and they're the people I see every Tuesday night at Life Group. I'd like to be baptised because most of all sort of God commands us to do it in like Matthew 28 and it sort of for me helps to sort of cement my relationship with God because it's like a public declaration of you know, your relationship with him. 
I, I want to be baptised because I think it is a big step to getting closer um, with God and Christ. And it is a, a big leap into my journey as a Christian. I want to be baptised because I feel within myself, it feels right. I felt like it was the right time. I feel like this is a part of my journey. I feel like this was meant to happen. And I'm ready to have my relationship with Jesus grow stronger and closer. And I feel like this is the right step to be going down that path, so yes. Great. Great to hear their stories, um, and uh, we're going to we're going to baptise them now. Um, baptism is a uh, there's a number of symbols with baptism, uh, mostly speaking of the work God has done in us. And so there's a symbol of dying as we go under the water and rising to new life um, coming up. There's a symbol of uh, being washed clean, um, and so we we embrace those symbols as we think of the work that God has done. Um, there's a command that we're commanded to do, go and uh, be baptised, Peter says, um, in Acts 2. Uh, but also we're commanded to do the baptising, that we should baptise people. There's a fellowship uh, component that happens here, inviting them to be part of uh, God's uh, family and, and celebrating that. And so we're going to do that with baptism. We're also going to do that later with um, confirmation. And uh, Gary's here with us, uh, the Western Sydney Bishop. And uh, we're going to hear more from him later and uh, we'll celebrate through confirmation and he'll explain more of that. But I'm going to invite uh, the three nervous ones <laughs> up here. Come on up, guys. <laughs> and uh, Miles is going to come and help me here, make sure I don't drop anyone they can't get out of the water. Um, yeah, and you're, you're lucky, you're lucky on this end, so uh, you get decided first. Come on, come on in. Sit. Step down in the deep section there. All right, so we'll just put your hands up here. Uh, Yoan, I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. on over, Jack. Jack, I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Caitlin's already laughing. <laughs> All right, Caitlin, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What a terrific celebration it is. Uh, we're going to let these guys go and get into some dry, clean clothes. We'll see them, we'll see them later a little bit drier. But uh, we're going to continue now in prayer, and Dries is going to come and lead us in that. Yes, uh, Jungle Kids, <laughs> thanks for joining us. You are free to go.
That one. All right. It helps when you turn it on. <laughs> Every day is uh, worth celebrating, but today is particularly special um, if we open our eyes to it and really look. So with that, let's close our eyes and celebrate in prayer together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with hearts full of gratitude and joy, celebrating your presence in our lives and the amazing work of your kingdom that unfolds each day. We rejoice in our relationship with Jesus, who guides us, redeems us, and fills our lives with purpose and hope. We thank you for the great gifts found in the small pleasures of our mornings, the warmth of the sun, the embrace of a loved one, the simple but profound moments that remind us of your goodness. These small graces anchor us in your love and point us to the abundant life you offer. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us all together this morning, both in person and online. We are one body in Christ, united in faith and love, no matter the distance between us. Today, we especially lift up Ewan, Jack, and Caitlin as they take the significant steps of baptism and confirmation. We celebrate their commitment to follow you, and we ask that you continue to guide them, filling their lives with your presence and equipping them to be the lights that they are in this world. We ask for your continued blessing on our youth ministries, both Fridays and Sundays. We thank you for revealing yourself through your word and for using those who serve to shape the lives of our young people, preparing them to live life to the fullest. Remind us to be the humble, open, loving models we wish to see in our kids and students. Lord, we pray that you would work in, in and through our relationships with one another, whether we are young or old, thriving or merely surviving, searching or finding. Help us to support and uplift each other, reflecting your love and grace in all our interactions. We lift up those in our congregation who are sick or dealing with loss, comfort them with your peace and surround them with your healing presence. For those battling temptations, give them strength and wisdom to overcome. For those anxious about money, reputation, any other burden, grant them peace and remind them of your faithful provision. And still in us, the learnings from our study of Hebrews, reminding us that Jesus is greater, greater than our fears, greater than our struggles, and greater than any obstacle we may face. May we live each day in the light of this truth. We praise you for the connections and community we sometimes take for granted. A warm drink prepared with loving hands, the beautiful voices that lead us in worship, a caring prayer from a friend, or the help of a fellow believer. Thank you for the ministries and groups that make these connections real and tangible. Grant us wisdom and good stewardship over these blessings, that they may continue to flourish and bear fruit in our lives and the lives of others. As we go about our days, give us full, brave hearts to see the many needs of those around us. We want to be images of you, Lord, and do as Jesus did when he cared for those around him, not with theories, but with words and actions and giving. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning. What a wonderful morning it is. Today we're reading from the book of Hebrews, which is middle of the New Testament. If you are new um, to the church or new to reading the Bible, you've got the table of contents at the front. So we're reading Hebrews 4 verses 14 um, to 16 and 5 to 10. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. 
This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is the subject to the same weaknesses. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as theirs. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants such an honor. He must be called to God for work, just as Aaron was. This is why God did not honor himself by assuming he could become high priest. No, he was chosen by God, who, ca- who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And in another passage, God said to him, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because his, because his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And God designated him to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Thank you for that. Good morning. Oh, good morning, everybody. My name is Gary. I'm the uh, local bishop. Uh, it's nice to see you here. A special welcome to those of you who are guests or visitors here for the baptism and confirmation. I'll tell you a bit more about confirmation later. If you want to know what a bishop does, you can come talk to me later. It's not that interesting. All right. Uh, what, what is interesting is God's word. Uh, what we usually do at church is we ask God to help us to understand his word. Not that it's hard to understand, but, you know, we, we can get all the help we can get sometimes. We need, you know, uh, so uh, we, if you join me in prayer as we pray and ask God to bless us as we come to his word, please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us this morning. We thank you for witnessing the baptism of our friends. We thank you that you have give us the Holy Spirit and your word. We pray, Father, that by your spirit you might open our eyes and hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me start with an unusual question. Uh, Why would anyone ever need a priest? Why would anyone ever need a priest? I mean, you might want one uh, if you're getting married in a church. You might want a priest for that. You might want one to visit you in hospital if things weren't going well for you. If things got worse, you might want a priest to do your funeral. Uh, But outside of those occasions... Who needs a priest? And that makes our passage uh, that was just read out to us from the Bible, uh, from the letter to the Hebrews, a little bit puzzling because this part of the Bible is all about priests and how Jesus is actually a greater priest, a greater priest, a priest worth sticking with and placing your trust in. And this and this theme of Jesus being greater, as we've already heard in the prayer, Uh, continues what we've been seeing throughout the letter to the Hebrews, uh, that Jesus is greater than any other alternative. He is the greater revelation. He is the greater man. He is the greater Moses. And now Jesus is the greater priest. And why is this important? Well, it's important for those who were the first recipients of this letter because uh, it's the letter to the Hebrews. These are Jewish Christians that the letter was addressed to. And these were Jewish Christians who were having second thoughts. Uh, You might think that living as a Christian in Australia right now is difficult, but it was very, very difficult in the Roman Empire. And if you were a follower of Jesus, uh, you could face ridicule and beatings, dispossession and imprisonment. So as a result, it was very, very tempting to turn your back on Jesus and go back to living 
the way you did before, which in this case was back to the Jewish religion, which was recognized by the Roman Empire. And that's why uh, this letter, this letter to the Hebrews, has this theme of Jesus being greater. Jesus is greater, don't turn back, is what the letter is saying to those it was first written for. And, you know, when something is greater, it puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Right? It puts other things in perspective. We've seen this over the last few weeks have we been, as we've been watching the Olympics. Anybody been watching the Olympics? Yes? A few of us? Good, isn't it? Paralympics coming. The more sport, the better. Um, what we've seen over the last few weeks, we've been seeing people compare things as they strive for greatness. And as they strive for greatness, they've been willing to put aside some things in order to achieve their goals. Uh, moving countries to train, uh, waking up early in the morning, following strict diets, going through rehab and surgery, enduring great hardship for that which is greater, which in their, th their case was to represent their country and to compete in the Olympics. And it's exactly the same with what we see here in Hebrews. Since Jesus is greater, he is worth following, no matter what the cost and what other people say. So, that's why our passage, uh, why that's why the letter is written the way that it is, and that's why our passage starts the way it does in verse 14. So please come with me in your Bibles to verse 14, which starts by saying, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. If Jesus is this great high priest and greater than any alternative and greater than any priest you'll ever find in the Jewish religion, then let us hold firmly to what we believe. Let's keep trusting Jesus and continuing as a Christian. That is the opening gambit from uh, the writer of the Hebrews. And that's the whole argument in a nutshell. Jesus is the greater priest, so let's hold firmly to what we believe. But it begs the question, well, how does that work? How does Jesus' greater priesthood lead to the fact that we should continue to follow him? And that leads to another question, uh, what is a priest and what does a priest do? And the writer gives us the answers at the beginning of chapter 5, which summarizes the role of priest in the Bible. And basically the role of the priest and the high priest in particular came down to two specific things that they did for God's people. So firstly, if you have a look at verse 1, a priest was a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. A priest was a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. And why do other people need a priest to do that for them? It's very simple. It's because God and sin just don't mix. God and sin don't mix. And the people of God who were seeking to have a relationship with God were guilty of sin. And that's not being harsh, because it's also true of all of us here, even today. Because what is sin? Sin is not just doing something bad or wrong, but it's about our whole attitude towards God. And basically, sin is saying yes to ourselves and no to God, and putting what we want and we think before what God wants and God thinks. And on that basis, even the very best of us are guilty of sin. Which also means that we, like Israel, need a priest. We need a priest to have a relationship with God. Because what does the priest do in order to represent others to God? If you go back to the passage, it tells us that the priest presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. In other words, what is a priest? A priest is a go-between. A priest is a broker. A priest is a mediator. A priest is a peacemaker. That's what a priest is, who stands between people and God to deal with the problem of their sins. And how does the priest do that? By offering sacrifices and gifts in their place to pay the price for their sins and restore their relationship with God. That's what a priest does. And that's why people need a priest. Because what does sin, what does sin do to a person's relationship with God? It makes them an enemy of God puts them on the wrong side of God and the wrong side of his judgment. But by offering a sacrifice in the place of that person, what happens is that God's judgment falls on the sacrifice and the price is paid for the sin so that the person has their slate wiped clean, sins dealt with, 
and can reconnect with God. So that's the first thing that a priest does for uh, one of the people of God. And the second thing is found in verse 2, which is that a priest would also deal gently with ignorant and wayward people. And that sounds a bit threatening, doesn't it? It sounds a bit like a policeman, you know, with a speed camera. Uh, but we need to pay attention to the way they are to do this. <coughs> Please notice that they are to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people. They are to correct people and guide people with compassion. With compassion, wanting what's best for them, out of a desire for their good, like the very best teachers or the very best coaches. That, that, that's what it's saying there. That's how they are to guide and correct the people of God. And they are to do this by, and we're told this elsewhere in the book of Leviticus, they are to do this by discerning good from bad on behalf of God's people by teaching God's people God's word from the Bible. And they are to do this while not looking down on them or thinking they're superior, but they are to do this, to discern good and bad as a fellow traveller. Because if you'll notice that uh, the priest, he himself is subject to the very same weaknesses. And this is good, isn't it? Uh, this is good, I don't know about you, uh, but if I've got something wrong and I'm not quite on top of stuff, the last thing I need is someone to look down at me and tell me what to do. I mean, that's terrible. Ever happened to you? You know, you've got something wrong. You know you've got something wrong. And someone says, oh, you're such a dill, right? <laughs> if I wouldn't have done that. I mean, that's, that's hopeless. That's a terrible way of uh, helping, right? It's so much better, isn't it, when someone comes alongside you and understands where you're coming from and said, I could have done that. Let, let's, let's work together and make things better. That's, that's far better, isn't it? And that's what a priest was supposed to do. That's how a priest was to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people. And here is the extraordinary thing when it comes to Jesus being a priest. And it's also part of why Jesus is greater than every other priest. Because think about it for a moment. Who is Jesus? Who, who is Jesus? Right? Jesus is a priest, but who is Jesus? Uh, let me bring you back to the very opening verses to the letter to the Hebrews. This is what we're told about Jesus. Jesus is the one through whom we can know God most clearly. He's the one through whom we can know God most clearly. He's the greater revelation. He is the one through whom the whole universe was made. Jesus is the creator uh, through whom and for whom everything was made. Jesus is also God's son and is appointed heir of all things. Everything is his. And he's the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And this Jesus, in all his magnificence and splendor and glory, what Hebrews tells us is this Jesus gets us. This Jesus gets us. And you can see this, you come back with me to chapter 4, verse 15. Where the writer to the Hebrews tells us that this high priest of ours, Jesus, understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Jesus understands our weaknesses. For he faced the same testings we do. The same struggles, the same temptations, the same challenges of life. And this is why Jesus, though fully God, and all those other things we've seen from the beginning of Hebrews, became human in the first place. Uh, back in chapter 2, verse 17, we're told that it was necessary for him, Jesus, to be made in every respect like us. So he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Why? Because since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Jesus knows what it's like to be a human being. He became one of us. And this is even more so because of what we read at the end of chapter 4, verse 15. We are told that Jesus faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And you might think, well, actually, that makes Jesus weird. That makes Jesus an alien. Uh, because Jesus is the only person who has never sinned against God. How can Jesus possibly understand us? But what I think the writer of the Hebrews is trying to say is a bit like this, that since Jesus knows what it's like to be 
tempted and tested and to suffer without ever giving into it. Jesus is actually the perfect priest because he knows the very limits of temptation like no one ever has. It's a bit like being a runner preparing for the city to surf. Any city to surf runners here? No, I, didn't, I don't run the city to surf. Occupational hazard being run on a Sunday. But anyway, uh, that's my excuse and I'm sticking with it, right? It's a bit like being a runner preparing for the city to surf and your coach is an ultra marathon runner, right? That coach knows what it's like to run more than 14 k's. Right? They know what it's like to keep on running. They know what it takes to push. They know how hard it can be. They know what it's like to want to give up. And they can tell you that they've done it and made it all the way to the end. That's what it's like to have Jesus as your priest. Jesus is like that for us when it comes to us and sin and living a life pleasing to God. He knows that it's hard. Right? His public ministry started off with great temptation. He knows that it involves suffering. He has suffered greatly for following God. And because he's done it himself, he totally gets it and gets us as we journey. And, and what is the result of all that? What is the result of Jesus getting it, of Jesus getting us? Well, friends, it gives us confidence. It gives us confidence to approach God. Verse 16. Uh, we are told that because Jesus gets it, we should come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Because Jesus, as our priest, having God and experienced what it's like to be us, will speak to God on our behalf with sympathy, with understanding. Not as someone looking down on us, but as a fellow traveller, fully understanding what it's like to be tempted and to suffer helping us to find the mercy and the grace and the help we are seeking when we need it most jesus gets us and will be there for us and speak to us sympathetically on our behalf to god which means that we can have great confidence this no matter what situation we're facing to approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence because of jesus pretty good isn't it but that's not all because not only does Jesus get us and know what it's like to be one of us and will speak to God when we come to him for help, but because Jesus faced all the same testings we have but did not sin, Jesus as our great high priest can offer his life as our sacrifice as well. And this is something that no other priest could ever do. Because every other priest, if you go back to chapter 5, verse 3, every other priest has to offer a sacrifice for their own sin as well. They're not qualified to offer their own lives as a sacrifice. But Jesus doesn't have to do that because Jesus never sinned. And in verse 8, we're told that even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered, which is another way of saying that even though Jesus was God's son, with all the privileges that came with that, he did what was asked of him as a high priest and human being. He learned obedience. He lived a perfect life. Despite temptation and suffering, Jesus never sinned. And it's this that qualifies him to be our perfect high priest and sacrifice. Verse 9. And the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And how does that work? How can Jesus be the source of eternal salvation? Well, we'll need to go to another part of Hebrews a little bit later on in Hebrews chapter 7, which once again speaks about the priesthood of Jesus. And it's a little bit of a longer passage here, but it'll come up on the screen. I hope you'll be able to stick with me. Hebrews chapter 7 tells us that he, Jesus, is the kind of high priest we need because he's holy and blameless, unstained by sin. We've already seen that. He's been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honour in heaven. Unlike those other priests, the priests of the Jewish religion, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. I mean, Jesus is totally different, isn't he, from every other priest. Jesus' sacrifice is totally different from every other sacrifice. 
And the thing I want you to pay attention to here from these verses is the phrase, once for all. Once for all. Because of who Jesus is, the very Son of God in all his splendor and glory, and because of what Jesus did, live a perfect life, when Jesus acts as our high priest standing between us and God and offers himself as a sacrifice for us, how? By dying on the cross on that very first Good Friday, bearing the consequence of our sins on himself in our place by taking the full force of God's judgment. Unlike every priest and sacrifice before him, which had to be done again and again and again and again, Jesus' sacrifice is once for all. Once for all. It is fully sufficient, fully effective, paid in full, signed, sealed and delivered. With nothing more for us or anyone else to do. Because Jesus, our great high priest, has done it all by offering himself as our perfect sacrifice and what he has achieved this salvation from judgment and hell uh, this rescue from the consequences of our sins is also as the writer of Hebrews says an eternal salvation it is a salvation that lasts forever why because Jesus our great high priest has risen from the dead never to die again and unlike every other priest that comes and goes, you know, priests can come and go, can't they? They can change location. They can be disqualified from their, uh, their role. They, the, every human priest will eventually die. Unlike every other priest, in Hebrews chapter 7, we're told again, but because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he's able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. How good is that? How good is that? This is what a person has when they trust in Jesus. When they trust in Jesus as their greater priest, they can be sure that Jesus will always be there for them and always ready to speak to God on their behalf for how long? Forever. Forever. Which means they will be right with God, forgiven and set free, a child of God both now and forever and that's why today is such a celebration because this is what baptism and confirmation are ultimately pointing to I mean they're not rituals to somehow make you right with God they're not somehow sacrifices to God or anything like that no 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 these are things that point to Jesus and what he has done for those who trust him as their great high priest and there are also things that point to the confidence you can have having decided to place your trust in him. Because Jesus is not only a greater priest, but a priest forever who will always be there for you. Guiding you through life. Fully understanding. Always willing and available to speak to God on your behalf. Fully qualified to be both priest and and sacrifice so you can totally relax when it comes to you and God and what difference does that make to have that type of confidence when it comes to uh, that comes from trusting in Jesus well let me tell you uh, about a man called Bob who uh, I met many years ago back in church uh, Bob was an interesting man in his 50s very pale always wore a hat not for the sake of fashion uh, but because Bob had no hair, because uh, Bob had cancer and was undergoing chemotherapy. And I remember talking to Bob at the end of the church one day, and I asked him, look, how, how, how's things going, Bob? Uh, how's chemo this week? And he said, uh, I didn't have any chemo, Gary. It's not working anymore. And the doctors and I have agreed that it's time to stop. And I said, well, that's no good. How do you feel? And Bob said something quite surprising. He said, I'm so thankful that God has brought me back, uh, brought me to this church and back to himself. I was wondering, Gary, if you'd be willing to do my funeral. And I said, well, of course, that, 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 that'd be a great honour. I'd be glad to do that. But what are you going to do now? 
He said, I need to tell my family and friends that I'm going to die. But in the time I've got left, I want to be helping people come to know God. I said, it's good to be Christian, isn't it? And he said, it's fantastic. Then I asked him, are you ready to meet God? And he said, I can't wait. Bob had been Christian for just four weeks. And he ended up dying only a few weeks later. But that's the type of confidence a person can have by trusting in Jesus and what he has done for them. Not only at the end of one's life, like Bob from my story, but right throughout life, no matter who you are. So let me finish by asking you this question. Is Jesus your priest? Is Jesus your priest? Have you placed your trust in him? And do you feel confident approaching God when you need to? And are you ready to meet him when your time finally comes? Because while there are many things in life that can make us feel anxious, and this world can be complex and far from straightforward, those who trust Jesus have one thing that is absolutely certain that they'll never have to worry about. They'll never have to worry about whether Jesus will be there for them. Because Jesus is the priest that we all actually need who gets us and will, all, will always, forever, be there for those who trust him. That's why Jesus is the greater priest and a priest worth sticking with and placing one's trust in. I'm going to pray. Please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonders and greatness of knowing Jesus. We thank you for all his splendor, for all his power, for all his glory. We also thank you for his humility and service and being willing to be our priest, to speak to his Father on our behalf. And his extraordinary love and being willing to give up his life as a perfect sacrifice for sin. We pray, Father, that we might be encouraged by what we've heard in the Bible, so that we might have confidence to press on for Jesus and keep on approaching your throne of grace, knowing that Jesus is a priest for us forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand again and sing um, as we reflect on who we are in Christ. Um, we can have confidence because of who Jesus is um, and who he says that we are. So let's stand and sing together. Jesus died for me. Yes, he died. 
Hello, everybody. Please be seated. We're going to continue on to doing the confirmation now. I might invite our confirmation candidates to come up. Where's Yo and Jack and Caitlin? They're here somewhere. Come stand on my right. Uh, what is confirmation? Confirmation is something we do after baptism. It's something we usually do after the baptism of a child, confirming the promises into which they were baptised. But we've already saw from the video that they fully know why they're getting baptised. So why are we doing it? Well, we can think of this more as a kind of like a welcome into the broader Anglican uh, fellowship. Uh, here in Sydney, in case you didn't realise, we have 270 parishes uh, spreading from, let's see, Lithgow in one corner, uh, Lidcombe up to White... No, 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 Lithgow... Waitara down to Ulladulla. That's better. I was just thinking Western region because that's the most important region. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> tiny bit biased. So there is a sense that we're all here trying to grow as disciples of Jesus and trying to reach this city with the great news about Jesus. So think of it that way. What we're going to do, we're going to ask them some questions. Um, we're going to ask you at least one question which you were provided the answer for. We're going to say the creed. We're going to pray. It's all good. And it's all about Jesus. Okay? And I'm going to pull my glasses out. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, by your Holy Spirit, you've called these your servants and made them your children by adoption and grace. Mercifully grant that being strengthened by the same Spirit, they may continue your servants and receive your promises through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I see you've got the answers now. Very good. Uh, those who are to be confirmed are first invited to reaffirm the promises made at their baptism. You must therefore declare your allegiance to Christ, your rejection of all that is evil, the devil and all his works, the empty display and false values of the world, and the sinful desires of the flesh. I'm going to ask you each a question individually, and I'll begin with you, uh, Johan. Johan, do you turn to Christ? Jack, do you turn to Christ? Caitlin, do you turn to Christ? All right, now I'm going to ask you these questions together. You might want to share the answers. <laughs> do you repent of your sin? Do you reject selfish living and all that is false and unjust? Do you renounce Satan and all evil? Will you each, by God's grace, strive to live as a disciple of Christ, loving God with your whole heart and your neighbour as yourself until your life's end? Fantastic. Well done, people. All right. Now, for you, the congregation, you have heard these our, brother, uh, our brothers and sister respond to God's call to love and serve him throughout their lives. Will you support them in this high calling? Terrific, thank you. All right, now you are to be confirmed must now yourselves affirm before God and his church, the Christian faith into which you were baptised. And what I want to do now is invite the whole congregation to stand and join with our friends here in saying uh, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the Creed is in a question and answer format, but just follow on and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll soon catch on what's going on. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in God the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the, th on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We come now to confirm those who have been baptised and instructed in the Christian faith, laying hands on them and praying that God's indwelling spirit will strengthen and guide them throughout their lives. Let us pray that God who has begun a good work in these, our brothers and sister, 
will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Please join me in prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, you've been pleased to grant to your servants new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and have given them forgiveness of their sins. Strengthen them, we pray, with the Holy Spirit. Grant that they may grow in grace and give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of discernment and inner strength, the spirit of knowledge and true godliness and fill them, Father, with wonder and awe in your presence, now and forever. Amen. We're going to pray for our friends now. And if you're here in particular to support uh, the person I'm praying for, I'm going to invite you to stand as we pray for them. So I'm going to start with Johan. So if you're here to support Johan, I invite you to stand. Let us pray. Strengthen, Lord, your servant Johan with your Holy Spirit. In power and sustain him for your service. Amen. All right, please be seated. And if you're here to support Jack, let me invite you to stand as I pray for him. Let us pray. Strengthen, Lord, your servant Jack with your Holy Spirit. In power and sustain him for your service. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Sam. Caitlin's go. Same again, please be seated. If you're here to support Caitlin, please stand. Let us pray. Strengthen, Lord, your servant Caitlin with your Holy Spirit. Empower and sustain her for your service. Amen. Please be seated. You might want to give our confirmees a round of applause. I'm going to invite you to say the prayer our Lord taught us uh, together and then I'll close off uh, this part with another prayer before we uh, sing our final song. So please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, please continue with me in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty and ever-living God, we pray for these your servants upon whom we have now laid our hands, following the apostles' example, to assure them of your love for them. May your fatherly hand ever protect them. Let your Holy Spirit ever be with them to uphold them in the love of Christ and to lead them in obedience to your word. Strengthen them with your heavenly grace and keep them in eternal life through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. With us as we sing our final song. Do we have keys? Sorry.
sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my praise for this I bring, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks for joining together. What a great celebration it's been. I particularly love that we gave the bishop the passage that answers the question, what is a priest? That was a great choice there, but a great reminder too um, of our confidence in Jesus. We're going to continue celebrating through community time. And so the jumping castle is up. Uh, there's food out there. Uh, just jump on the line or the hot drink, the coffee machine is going. One other thing, if you have children with you over in the kids programs, don't forget to pick them up. Um, I know, it, it feels convenient to leave them, but uh, the team have done their time. It's your time again. So uh, go grab your kids, enjoy some time in community.